forget every year, I just forget what summer is like in the Northwest and how there is an actual mass exodus of people for, for weeks at a time to go and find the, the hottest and sunniest places they can possibly find and just get some of that vitamin D that we've been missing for nine months. And I'm feeling that. I, I, I want you to know if I had the means, I'd, I'd be somewhere else for a couple of weeks and... Um, yeah, I don't blame you. If you've if you, if you got vacation scheduled, if you've already been and come back, praise God. Thank you for coming back. Um, and then if you're going, please come back. Uh, that's all I got to say about that. Uh, I know Kevin mentioned this, but I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to say it again. If, if you don't have a copy of The One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven by Mark Cahill, grab one on Amazon. It's an easy read. Mark is a down-to-earth guy. He's a good buddy uh, back in Atlanta. Um, Mark's the kind of guy, you, you can walk up in Atlanta and see him sitting in a car with a prostitute and not be worried about him because you know he's sharing the gospel. That's the kind of guy he is. Everywhere he goes, everybody he talks to, he finds some way to talk about Jesus. And I just love that. So this book is just, it's such a good book. It's really practical. Uh, we're, we're in the Harmony of the Gospels. This is week 10, and we're in John chapter 2. Verse, tw- verse 12, and we're going to go all the way into chapter 3, verse 21 this morning. This, this, for whatever reason, this section of the harmony is all happening in the Gospel of John. So we won't be jumping from Luke to Mark to Matthew to John. We're just going to be in John. Um, last week, we talked about Jesus not being safe. If you were here or if you watched the... I don't, I don't even know if we posted last week. Um, yeah, it's okay. We'll catch up. We'll catch up. Kevin wasn't here. It didn't happen. Um, so that's good. That's okay. Kevin was on vacation. Um, but we, we talked about Jesus not being safe. He knew he was here for a purpose. And Jesus knew that he only had a short time to identify and train a handful of men who were going to turn the world upside down. He was just laser focused on his mission. But there were some distinctions which we mentioned in passing. There were almost Maybe the word rules is too, too, too hard a word, but just kind of guidelines for the way he handled certain people or certain segments of society. For example, uh, consider the difference in the way Jesus handles re- the religious establishment and the way he handles sinners or, or people who are in need. And, and I get it. Like uh, After almost 24 years of full-time ministry, you know sometimes it's easier to be gracious to outright sinners than it is to stodgy church people. You know, it's just one of those things. I know a great many truly humble people who are actually some of the most intelligent people I've ever met who realize just how little they know in the, in the grand scheme of the cosmos. And then I've met people who are the inverse of that. I know people who think that they know everything, and they go around telling everybody that they know everything. And you just go, really? Um, th- this, this is the reality uh, in our world, and it points us, or it should, towards the learning of the lesson of humility, especially with regards to our relationship with the one true and living God, who knows all things. We're never going to, you're never going to stand next to God and be like, hey, did you know? Okay, he, he knows. And, and remember we said last week in relationship to this, this, this paradigm is that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so we want to be in that first category of, uh, well, no, we don't want to be in the first category. He opposes the proud. We want to be in the second category. Let me just rephrase that. We want to be in the, in the humble category. Um, th- those are the people God gives grace to. So let's do a little thought experiment this morning. Uh, let me show you what I mean as part of our introduction. I first encountered this in my campus ministry days at one of our annual staff conferences. Uh, Frank Mashburn was our campus director at the University of Tennessee, and I've forgiven him for that because they wear orange, and that's not a Georgia Bulldog. Um, but we, we got along just the same. Uh, but he shared this with our national team at our annual conference. He got up, and he just asked one question as he began his talk. He said, what is light? And, and believe it or not, that's actually pretty pertinent to our conversation this morning. He says, what is light? And after a few moments of the awkwardness of the silence that we've just experienced in this room, someone offered a thought. They said, well, light acts like a wave. And somebody else chimed in and countered with, yeah, but it also acts like a particle. And Frank said, you're both right. Sometimes light acts like a wave and sometimes it acts like a particle. But what is it? 
Somebody else chimed up and said, well, we, we know that it moves at the speed of light. And several people began to chuckle because we were beginning to see our predicament. Frank patiently asked, what is light? And the room was silent. And then one resilient college senior decided he would step in and he offered, well, if we could move at the speed of light, time would stop. And everybody chuckled again because the senior had come nowhere close to answering the question and because everybody was awakening to this thought experiment. See, we we would do well to embrace humility with every chance we get. Consider this thing that we take for granted, this all around us all the time called light, which is something that our best and brightest scientists cannot actually explain. We know what it does under certain circumstances, but we don't know what light is. Yet without it, we can't see. And this is why I think it's an appropriate and good metaphor for John the Apostle to employ light in order to communicate about who God is. And if you want the full treatment on this, go home and read 1 John this afternoon. But the metaphor of light being something so familiar to us is actually meant to humble us because we don't know what it is. We, we, we know what it does. We know how it acts, but we don't know what it is. And, and so God opposes the proud, category one. He, he gives grace to the humble, category two. So John's gospel begins and ends with declarations of the deity and divinity of Christ. And everything in between those two bookends reverberates with the theme of who Jesus is. And, and we've read and studied the gospel accounts, and, and it's increasingly ir- ironic that Jesus' ministry is characterized by conflict with the Pharisees and their unbelief. These are the religious leaders, and they, they, they're steeped in unbelief. They thought they knew what light is. They thought they knew what light was. They're category one people. They're the proud people. And so with that framework in mind, let's look at the text this morning. We're in John 2, starting in verse 13. And it says, The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And so making a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers, and he overturned the tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Now, this is the Jewish Passover celebration, which commemorates the deliverance of Israel uh, from Egypt when the death angel passed over every home where the first Passover was observed and the blood of that Paschal lamb was placed on the doorposts and on the lintel of the home of the believing Jew who, who engaged in that ritual. Right? It wasn't the ritual that saved. It was the faith that the death angel would pass over according to the promise that God had given. And so this celebration of the Passover commenced the Feast of Unleavened Bread so that the entire Passover celebration took up like an entire week on the calendar. And attendance in Jerusalem at the temple was compulsory for adult Israelite males. And not just for this, but for two other feasts annually. There are three that you had to attend, and there were some others that you could attend. But it's, it's really very difficult to estimate the influx of people into Jerusalem, not only from the other parts of Israel, but from all over the world. You go, there were Jews all over the world? Well, yeah, by the time we get to Acts chapter 2, remember we see there are Jews from every nation, right? And they're there, and they're speaking in their languages, and Right, and, and then that's when the whole Holy Spirit thing happens there in Acts 2. But these Jews and, and proselytes, that's a word that means people who've converted to Judaism, that they would have to, for this, this event, they would have to pay um, a half shekel temple tax in the coinage of the temple because foreign money was not allowed in the temple. And so these worshipers had to offer their sacrifices. Many of them had traveled long distances. The only solution for them would have been to buy their sacrificial animal there in Jerusalem instead of traveling great distance with an animal, trying to keep it alive, feed it, having to carry the food for it. You know, it just becomes really cumbersome. 
So uh, in days gone by, they would have been able to purchase these animals and exchange their money in a place outside the temple courts. In fact, we read uh, in, in some of the hist- historians that at one time the animal merchants had set up across the Kidron Valley over on the Mount of Olives. And if you needed an animal for sacrifice, you would go over there and buy your animal and get what you needed and then come back to the temple for the sacrifice. But but by the time of Jesus, they're, they're actually setting up that marketplace in the temple courts. And it was certainly more convenient, but as we all know, you, you pay for convenience, right? So people could purchase their sacrificial animals right at the temple. They could exchange their money to pay the temple tax. And it, I mean, for me, it's really difficult to believe that this was the real reason this was done, Right? While it's true that every worshiper was allowed to bring to the temple an animal of his own selection, it wasn't really likely that anybody was going to try it. In all likelihood, it wouldn't have been approved by the judges, those privileged vendors who filled the money chests of Annas the high priest, and those who attempted to bring their own sacrificial animals often had them rejected by the temple priests, and they were therefore required to purchase approved animals And you can imagine how much higher the price was for that. So this is what's happening in the context of this scene. And and, and the same gouging, no doubt, took place at the money changer's table. And we have to remember that the outer courts of the temple, the way God set this up, you've got the holy of holies, the holy place, the inner courts, and then the outer courts. And the outer courts of the temple were set apart for a group of people we call Gentiles. That's us, non-Jews who wanted to come and worship God, right? So this, it appears then that Gentile worship is functionally prohibited. I mean, nobody said you can't, but there's not really any room for you. So um, you, you just got to think this through. Can you, I mean, imagine trying to pray in the midst of a virtual stockyard with all the noise of animals and the bickering of businessmen. Can, can you even conceive of trying to squeeze in between cattle who are tied up in the temple courts? Think, think what a it's like to have to watch where you walk. You don't want to step in stuff as you're going to worship or, or kneel to pray and find yourself in a cow patty. It's just not that's, not, that's not what you want. So it appears that Gentile worship is functionally prohibited, and I doubt that that troubled many of the Jews who were not excited about including the Gentiles in the, their worship in the first place. And so this is the scene. This is the scene that Jesus walks into. You just imagine this. Imagine the sounds and the smells of the temple which has become basically a stockyard. <clears throat> the place of prayer has become a place of profit-taking and ripping people off in the name of the worship of God. And the whole place, I mean, it probably sounded like the trading floor of the New York Stock Exchange, right? It, you know, it smells like a barnyard. You can see why Jesus is indignant. Can you begin to step into the person of Jesus and what he's thinking about and why he's so angry in this moment. In this moment. And so verse 18, so the Jews said to him, what sign are you going to show us for doing these things? In other words, by whose authority? Who, who do you think you are coming in here and wrecking our money changing, wrecking our uh, selling of, of, of animals for, for, all this, you know, for all this worship? The Jews said, uh, no, excuse me, verse 19, Jesus said to them, destroy this temple And in three days, I will rise it up. And the Jews said, it was taking 46 years to build this temple. You're going to raise it in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So so Jesus comes into the outer court of the temple, and he fashions a whip from materials at hand, probably some of the ropes that they used to tie up the animals. And, and And he begins to drive people out of the temple, just cracking that whip, you know, lashing people, driving them out of the temple, driving the animals out of the temple. And, 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 I, and I assume by the word all, I understand him to have driven out not just the animals, but the people as well, right? And, and, and the coins of the money changers are poured out. They're scattered all over the ground, and the tables are overturned. And Jesus is angry. And I don't know if that violates your idea of Jesus, but Jesus gets angry. He gets indignant. He's angry at these people who are attempting to manipulate this religious observance before God in order to make a profit. He hates that. He hates it. The poor are shamefully cheated. The worship of God is hindered and impoverished instead of being facilitated and enriched. And the worshiper who came to the temple seeking a quiet place 
for fellowship with God, had to, has to push his way through stalls of cattle? I mean, what is that? And I suspect many must have probably inwardly at least lamented this situation, but it seems like nobody was bold enough to rebuke and, and abolish this profaning of God's house. So in steps the Son of God. Now he's the representative on earth, right? So he's going to step in and do something about this. This text gives us a clear affirmation of divine sonship, right? This is something that nobody else had dreamed of doing. Not Moses, Solomon, Ezra. Nobody ever termed the tabernacle or the temple his father's house. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. And so take note of the result. One man in a, in a pretty large temple complex with lots of other people and animals made a whip of cords and the whole crowd flees before him. Now, I want to suggest to you that this is no mere man. This is the terror of God falling upon these people. I think this was a supernatural moment. This wasn't just Jesus yelling and, and, and lashing. I think the fear of God came upon the people in the temple. Jesus displays an incredible zeal for his Father's house. And, and God's desire for us is that we would strive for purity in our worship too. I mean, we're not coming bringing animals for sacrifice, but we're coming bringing ourselves. We bring ourselves before him as a, sac- as a living sacrifice. And, and, and so... You know, we're rooted in this reality. How we come to God is important to him, right? He sees and he weighs the motives of our hearts. He knows, he knows our motives even when we don't, right? And, and so this, you, you see this, you see this um, the way this is set up at the time of Jesus, um, there were steps leading up to the temple that have been set at varying heights and varying depths, Okay. So um, some steps were higher than other steps and some were deeper back and they varied as you ascended. It's not like going up a staircase in a building today because, you know, like OSHA and everybody's like, they've got to be uniform, the same depth, same height. Every step has to be exactly the same so people don't trip and sue you and because we're such a litigious society, right? And we got to protect everybody because everybody's a grown baby that needs to be protected. And that's our culture, right? Safety is the biggest, like the most important value. In it. It's crazy. Uh, so, so there wasn't like that at all, where you could, you know, you can go up a flight of steps in a building and not even have to look at what you're doing because they're all uniform and you're just going to go up, 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 up. But these steps coming into the temple, they were varying widths and depths. So you had to pay attention. You had to be a little circumspect. You had to, you had to think about what you were doing. Or are you going to trip and fall on your face? And this is, this is rooted in a purpose, uh, purposefully set apart for God's people to remind them of the warning in Ecclesiastes 5 that Solomon wrote in verse 1 and 2. He says, guard your steps when you go into the house of God. And he says, well, sure, but why? Well, he goes on. He says, because to draw near to God, to listen, is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools because they don't even know that what they're doing is evil. And then he goes on and says this in verse 2. He says, don't be rash with your mouth. Don't let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, because he's in heaven and you're on earth. Let your words be few. So you better think about what you're doing when you come into God's presence. You come with circumspection. You come with, not with pride, but with humility. God opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble, right? This is the picture. And this incident of Jesus driving people out of the temple brings before us a side of Christ's character, which I think is almost universally overlooked today. We, we think of the Lord Jesus as gentle Jesus, meek and mild, the compassionate one, which is true, but we think of that at the expense of his other attributes. And when we do that, we get a Jesus that my friend Vic calls in his character, he calls it limp supermodel Jesus. That's, that's, that's who we set up in the American church. We, we set up limp-wristed supermodel Jesus. Um, it, see, Jesus is gentle. Jesus is compassionate. But that's not all that Jesus is. See, God says he's light as well as love. Yes, he's love. But, he, but light, light can be a garish thing. Light can be penetrating. Light can be obnoxious. I'm mean, just flashing back to, to my 
the first grade days, when my mom would come into my room and flip on the light, very first thing, and begin to sing obnoxiously, rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. And she'd been up for an hour and a half already drinking coffee, and I'm just like, ah, ah, right? Light's a great thing, but it doesn't it don't always feel good, right? So, so God is light and God is love. God is righteous and he's gracious. God is holy and God is merciful. And we do well to remind ourselves that there, there's, a, there's a tension and a balance in God of these things. Scripture declares it's a, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, as all who defy him will discover. It is with good reason Scripture speaks of the wrath of the Lamb. That's a crazy phrase. You think, I've seen lambs. I don't see a lot of wrath coming out of those little, yeah, oh, this is a different kind of lamb. The wrath of the Lamb. So I hope you're getting a picture in your mind of all this commotion, this uproar in Jerusalem that this blue-collar worker from Hicktown has stirred up. He, it, it, to, to everybody else, he's a nobody, right? But we know who he is. We know he's the Son of God. And you begin to understand why Nicodemus comes to him in the next chapter by night, right? Because he has stirred everything up. And as the Son of God, the temple is his Father's house, thus he has the right to correct temple abuses. He has the right to drive men and animals out of the temple courts. The Jews don't understand this at all. They probably walked away shaking their heads, convinced he's out of his mind. And the disciples don't understand either. It's not until the Lord's death and resurrection that this prophecy comes to their minds and they see how he fulfilled it exactly as he said uh, in verse 19, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. He wasn't talking about the physical temple. He was talking about his body. He's talking about himself, right? And they believed on the scriptures and what Jesus had spoken. And, and just for our edification before we move on, Jesus did speak about the destruction of the temple but he speaks about that later on in Matthew 24, verses 1 and 2. He tells us Jesus was leaving the temple complex. He's going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. Isn't this fabulous, Jesus? Look at all these great buildings that we built over, over many years. But he answered them. He said, you see all this, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be here left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And you got to know, they probably freaked out. They're like, what in the world are you talking about? And we know that this passage doesn't speak to Jesus' crucifixion, but to the actual temple in Jerusalem was sacked and destroyed by Titus Vespasian in 70 A.D. So that, that, that has happened. But verse 22 here, um, When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the Scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now I find that every miracle in Scripture both validates Jesus and affirms the trustworthiness of Scripture. Jesus did raise from the dead. He did come out of the grave. He defeated sin and death for us, right? Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. And so we go on to John 2, 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem for the Passover feast, many believed in his name when, he saw, when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, for his part, he did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And, and he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So because of Jesus' righteous indignation and the cleansing of the temple, many Jews who very likely had been just as frustrated about the practices that were happening in the temple courts, uh, they, they believed in his name. But Jesus did not entrust himself to them. He'd already hand-selected his guys, right? In other words, Jesus was not about gathering a large crowd for the sake of doing something big. He didn't care about big. He wanted to impart the, the mission to a handful of trustworthy people. He understood. He knew what was in mankind. He knew, he knew our fickleness and our personal ambition. So instead, Jesus just focused on 12 guys that he handpicked. He charged them with the mission, knowing his time on earth was short. And so we, we go on to John 3, 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one could do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, remember when we opened, I said religious people are category one people. They already think they know. And in this case, Nicodemus is one of those guys. Now, he's going he's gonna to shift categories over the term of his experience with Jesus. But right now, he's category one. 
And, and, and so like, if, if you don't know any Category 1 people, I'd love to introduce you to some so you have the experience of talking with them. Um, you know, just ask them. They'll tell you what Jesus prefers when it comes to what you wear and what Jesus prefers when it comes to what you eat and, and what you watch and what you listen to, right down to the toilet paper you use. They'll just tell you what Jesus wants for you. Um, and w- when it comes to right down to it, m- much of how religious people live is, is to see others and be seen by others. It's for, it's for the sake of the approval of man, not always for the approval of God. Appearances count for everything in religion. And this, this is part of the reason why it's so telling that Nicodemus comes to Jesus by cover of night, you know, under cover of darkness. He, he's not sure about this. He knows he's already made a scene. He's, he's on the bad side of the religious establishment. I'm not sure I want to be affiliated with this guy. I'm going to come, I'm going to come under cover of darkness so nobody knows that I'm talking to this guy. Okay, so the, the other part is what Jesus has been doing in Jerusalem in recent days, including what we've just seen with the cleansing of the temple. And there's a, so much buzz about this Galilean carpenter turned rabbi who drove the money changers out of the temple and he's doing other miracles. And, and so we can safely deduce that Nicodemus was either afraid or ashamed to be seen with Jesus, at least to some degree, and therefore came under cover of darkness. But we'll see that though he came by night, yet afterwards he, he owns Jesus publicly. This conversation is a big conversation for Nicodemus. So to his credit, Nicodemus can't overlook the weight of the evidence. And we'll see his fellow Pharisees quickly begin to find alternative explanations for Jesus' success. But Nicodemus just he, he can't get away or disengage from this personal conviction that Jesus has a divine mission. He, he possesses divine authority by which he speaks and by which he heals. And so Jesus answered in verse 3 and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You've got, this is the phrase, born again. This is where it comes from, John 3. You must be born again. If you're here in the room this morning and you've never been born again, I would encourage you to to find me after this service. I'd love to talk with you and pray with you. But here's something of note. Jesus mentions this idea of seeing all through the gospel accounts. And he takes seeing and he plays it against this concept of blindness. But he applies the blindness to spirituality, not just physical blindness, but being spiritually blind. And he says, you cannot see the kingdom of God without being born again because you're spiritually blind. And yet, again, it has nothing to do with your eyesight. But this notion of seeing just in this passage is mentioned four times. So it's a big deal. This idea of seeing spiritually, seeing the truth of who God is, seeing the truth of who Jesus is. And so in verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water, that's a physical birth, right? And spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit. So we get a little primer on the Holy Spirit here. And one of the main takeaways is that the Spirit is a person. Not, not a human person, but a person. He's not a, the Holy Spirit's not the force. This is not Star Wars, right? He's a person with a will and intelligence and, and, and one that communicates with us. And, and, and he acts according to, to the motives and the, the, what the Godhead wants to accomplish in us. See, all human beings, all of us, 100% of us, are born and then we proceed to die. And, and some of us, it takes longer to get there. And some of us get there quickly, but all of us die. But God has offered us a third element. See, we, you get to double up, just you life and death. And then he, and then he throws another life and another death in the mix and says, there are four of these, but you can choose three. Do you want to, uh, you have a physical life and a spiritual life and a physical death and a spiritual death. Those are four options. You can choose three of the four. See, you can live in this world and continue in sin, being spiritually dead, and then come to the end of your life in this world, and then be found 
in your sins, guilty before God, and experience the second death, which is eternal separation from God in hell. That's one life and two deaths. That's your three. Or you can live in this world, having repented of your sins and having put your faith in Christ alone for salvation. And when you come to the end of your life, you die physically, but then you go to be with Jesus. So you've been alive, and then you've died, and now you're alive forever. So you've got two, two lives, one death. You can choose which one you want, but you only get three out of the four. And it's your choice to make. And the reality is we can't see this with our eyes, at least not now. It's very much like what Jesus is saying here about the Spirit. You can't see the wind. You can only see the effects of the wind. So also you can't see the Spirit. You can only see the works and the effects of the Spirit. It sounds like our experiment and our introduction about light, right? It would seem Jesus is doing something very similar with Nicodemus, who thinks that he already knows and understands, and he's inviting him to humble himself. He's inviting him into humbleness when it comes to the things of God, inviting him to admit that he doesn't know nearly as much as he thinks he knows about the living God. Here's a, I stumbled upon this story this week. It makes the point really well. There's a president of a major university who was shopping at Christmas time. And as it happened, he passed by the Salvation Army volunteer, you know, standing there with the donation kettle. We've all passed, the, you know. And if you're Marv from, um, uh, what is that, Home Alone, you've wrapped your hand in duct tape and you stick your fist down, you know, get all the coins. That's such a great scene. Um, anyway, so the, the, the donation kettle and the bell ringing. And and, he, and so this, this uh, university... Um, president stops to make a donation and the woman volunteer asked him she said sir are you saved and he replied that he supposed that he was but she was not satisfied with his answer so she pursued the matter further she said what i mean is have you ever given your life fully to the lord jesus and at this point the president thought he should enlighten this persistent woman concerning who he was he said i'm the president of such and such university and as such I am also the president of the School of Theology. And the lady considered his response for just a moment, and then she replied, you know, it doesn't matter whatever you've been or wherever you are, you can still be saved. <laughs> I think that's great. God doesn't care about your pedigree. He doesn't care about your accomplishments. He cares about the condition of your heart. And whether your heart is hardened to the things of God or whether your heart is humble, to the things of God. I, I was reading again Matthew Henry's concise commentary this week, and I, and I just had to pull the paragraph into my notes. This is right out of Matthew Henry's commentary. He says, Birth is the beginning of life. To be born again is to begin anew, as those who have lived much amiss or to little purpose. We must have a new nature new principles, new affections, new aims. By our first birth, we were corrupt, shapen in sin. Therefore, we must be made new creatures. No stronger expression could have been chosen to signify a great and most remarkable change of state and character. This new birth is from heaven, and its tendency is to heaven. It's a great exchange made in the heart of the sinner by the power of the Holy Spirit. It, it means that something is done in us and for us, which we cannot do for ourselves. Listen, listen to that again. There's a change made in the heart of the sinner by the power of the Holy Spirit. Something is done in us and done for us that we can never do for ourselves. That's the gospel. That's salvation. And so Nicodemus says to Jesus, well, how can these things be? And Jesus said, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you don't understand these things? Truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we've seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I've told you of earthly things and you don't believe, how are you going to believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one's ascended to heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, we've got to stop and unpack that, that phrase. We've got to stop and unpack this idea of Moses and this bronze serpent, because most of us, 
you know, we've not studied the Old Testament as much as we've studied the New Testament. So let's unpack this. In fact, let me just read to you quickly Numbers 21, verses 1 through 9. The Israelites are wandering in the wilderness, uh, having, having disobeyed God, having uh, engaged in unbelief, even though God had provided for them and promised them uh, that he would deliver them. And so in their wanderings, uh, when the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Othram, he fought against Israel and he took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed give this people into our hand, then we will devote their cities to destruction. And the Lord heeded the voice of Israel and he gave the Canaanites over and they devoted them and their cities to destruction. So the name of the place was called Hormah. So just understand there are a lot of these skirmishes and battles and little wars happening during the time that they were in, uh, in this wandering. And, and so verse 4, from Mount Hor, they set out by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And they began, so it's like, you got a car full of kids and you're going on a trip. This, this is, that's exactly right. Are we there yet? Um, and so the people became impatient and the people spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food and no water. And we loathe this worthless food. What are they talking about? They're talking about manna, <laughs> the very food that God's given them. We loathe this. Nobody, anybody's kid use the word loathe? I loathe this meal. No, this is old, old English. I love it. We loathe this worthless food. And then verse 6 says, And then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. In other words, they were venomous. Their, their venom was, they weren't on fire. They, they were, just so you know, um, they were deadly. They bit the people so that many of, the, many of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We've sinned, for we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he would take the serpents away from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, here's what I want you to do, bro. That's not in the text. Um, he said, I want you to make a fiery serpent, an, an image, and set it up on a pole. And everybody who is bitten, when he sees it, when he looks at that, shall live. It didn't say they wouldn't feel pain. It said they would live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it up on the pole. And if the serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now, if, you, if you've studied the Bible at all, it, just one day, you're probably going, what is going on? It sure sounds like the God of Israel who forbid idolatry is encouraging idolatry. Doesn't it, doesn't it sound like that a little bit? He's not. He's not. In fact, he's foreshadowing Jesus. So, so did you catch it in the text? Anyone who sees it, looks upon it, in parentheses, in faith, in believing the promise of God. God said, God spoke. Here's his word. Do you believe what he said? Then do what he said. Okay? So he says, Anyone who sees it, anybody who looks upon it, they'll live. That's fascinating to me. The salvation God wrought for the Jews wasn't in the serpent. The salvation's not in the serpent. Rather, the salvation provided was, was in the people seeing, looking upon in faith that serpent, looking on it in faith, putting their faith in God's word, putting their faith in what he had said, his testimony, that he would deliver them if they acted in faith. That's the salvation, not the serpent. The serpent was just a stumbling block. It's like, can you, can you do what I told you to do? Are you going to do what I told you to do? See, this is the picture of Jesus on the cross. So I, can't, I can't get over it. That's a, that's, a, that's a Jewish carpenter. Like, really? You want me to look at that and live? Like, who is that? Really? It's, it's, it's a foreshadowing of the cross. And so here's this bronze serpent that has no power in itself, but for a religious people who are preoccupied with appearances, the bronze serpent was a stumbling block. And I choose that phrase very carefully because that's what we've been talking about all morning. Because it was a stumbling block for religious people obsessive about appearances, many failed to look upon it and they died. And Jesus is taking this Old Testament episode and he's applying it to himself and to salvation here in John 3. Listen to, listen to how Paul 
takes this on in Romans 9, verse 30. He says, what shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. (laughs) Well, that is a righteousness that's by faith. But Israel, who pursued the law that would lead to righteousness, never succeeded in reaching the law. Why? Because they didn't pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on their works. They've stumbled over that stumbling stone as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Did you note that the him pronoun is related to the rock? It's not a rock. It's a person. It's Jesus. Whoever whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This This is Paul writing about the gospel. Same, same apostle, different church, 1 Corinthians 1. Paul says the word of the cross, this, this message of salvation in the cross, is foolishness to those who are perishing. Just like the people who have been bitten by the serpent, they, they, they're like, I can't look at an idol. I can't look at something that's not... No, I can't, I can't do what God said to do. That just goes against my, what, what I think I believe. And, and it's like, well, God said this, right? And so... Paul says, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I'm going to destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I'm going to thwart. You think you got a high IQ? You're the man? God's like, "Mm -hmm. humble. We're going to humble you, right? So so, so then the humble person says, no, I just, whatever God says is what I believe. And God's like, that's my boy. That's, That's what I want. But Paul goes on. He says, where's the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Since in the wisdom of God, the world didn't know God through its wisdom. It pleased God through the folly, through the foolishness of what we preach to save those who believe. The, the, the access point to the gospel is not uh, in keeping with the world's ideology. They think these things are important. These things you need to know. These things you need to believe. And God says, no, it's just it's this. It's this. For since in the wisdom of God, the world didn't know God through its wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. And then listen to this. For Jews demand signs. And Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block to Jews and it's foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God, the foolishness of God is so much wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Who are you going to trust? Where are you going to put your faith? You know, we rolled out, if you saw them as you came in this morning, the new ER t-shirts, our outreach t-shirts this summer. But I'm finding myself in this moment wishing that instead of uh, obedience is better than sacrifice, I had put Christianity is for losers. I really, I'm really thinking about another batch. Christianity is for losers on the front. And some of you are sitting there going, like, why would you do that? Well, because of what we just read. Because of those who labor and work for righteousness have not attained it, according to Romans. Because the gospel of salvation is foolishness according to the wisdom of this world. It's a stumbling block to Jews. It's foolishness to Gentiles. And from the perspective of the world system, which would keep all men and women bound in sin, this way of salvation makes no sense at all. It makes no sense. And that's precisely how Jesus wants it. It doesn't make sense from the world's perspective. He wants those who are humble and who are keenly aware of their egregious sin and their heinous crimes against him to come to him in humility, not having worked for salvation, not having tried to earn some kind of salvation. He wants those who come by faith alone through grace that he's provided. And if you're here today, again, you've never put your faith in Jesus. You can do that today. And here's the reason why we get to John 3, 16. The reason that you can do that is because God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only son of God. And then then Jesus says this, this is the judgment 
the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their works are evil. That's the judgment of God. People love darkness where their evil deeds can't be seen clearly. And that ties us right back into John, 1 John. And, and, and the, the light coming into the world, the people of God dwelling in darkness that have seen the great light. We talked about that at the beginning of the sermon. But God so loved the world and, and all that he had made, especially men and women made in his image and likeness. Jesus didn't come to condemn us. Our sins had already done that. He came, he, we stand condemned already. He, he came to rescue us. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And if you believe on him, you can come out from under condemnation. Well, that's an incredible promise. But there are two sides to this coin. See, verse 19, this is judgment. Those who believe not on, the, on Jesus are condemned already. This is the assessment of the true condition of the human heart before a holy God as testified to by God himself. It also is the basis for the wrath of God being poured out on all flesh. And I know that's a really unpopular thing to say, even in the church at this moment. There, there's a movement afoot in the American church to tone down the rhetoric about wrath and hell and whatnot. We shouldn't talk about those things. I'm, I'm just like, too bad. Um, I'm not interested in dumbing down God's word for the sake of making people feel better on their way to hell. We can't do that. And people that would do, pastors that would say that, they're going to stand before God and answer for that. We cannot compromise the scripture that's so clear on this topic for the sake of making sinners more comfortable. Those who deny hell and God's justice, they only succeed in making sinners more comfortable on their way to hell and in the process damning them to the very eternal torment that they deny in an effort to appease sinners in the process. What is that about? That's not preaching the gospel. If we stoop to that, then we don't love our neighbor. And John tells us that if we say we love God, but we don't love our neighbor, we lie. And the truth is not in us. In verse 20, 21, we wrap up the text here. Jesus said, For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come into the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes into the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Jesus' admonition to all mankind is to come into the light where one's deeds can be clearly seen. And, and the light is Jesus. I fear that too often we come to Jesus like Nicodemus, like religious Jews, full of our own religious ideologies, full of our own presuppositions, and like religious people, appearances are everything to us. We want to look so good on the outside. It's like a beautiful cake with white icing. And then you take a bite of that cake and you find that the cake is burnt solid through. And it tastes absolutely awful despite its appearance. This is one of the main reasons I think our culture is increasingly uninterested in the Christian faith, because just beneath the surface of our lives, we, some of us taste really bad. We, we think we see clearly, but the truth is we're blind. Instead, we ought to embrace ongoing repentance. We need to immerse ourselves in the Word of God. We need to immerse ourselves in the fellowship of the saints and seeking and saving the lost. And to that end, some of you, I've been really excited to be on the, the comment thread uh, with the book that we're reading, or the book club. And by the way, it's not too late to jump in on that, by the way. Uh, we're reading Mark Cahill's book, The One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven. And I love this. Uh, I've known Mark Cahill for a very long time. Uh, started reading the book again. Uh, I don't know how many times I've read through this, but just started again this week. And, and page one just, again, arrested me. This is the very first page where the question we need to be asking ourselves every morning as we wake up is, what are we going to do today that matters forever? What am I going to do today that matters for eternity? Fast forward to eternity and there's only one reality. Who's in heaven and who's in hell? That's the reality forever. Your, your athleticism, your intelligence, your fame, your money, your power, your influence, your image, they aren't going to matter one iota. It's not going to matter at all. 
The only thing that's going to matter for eternity is whether or not you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. That's the only thing that's going to matter. Paul, Paul says, again, going to Paul, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, why do I have to stand before God? Well, he tells us. He says, so that each one of us may receive what is due. That could go two ways. We receive what is due to us for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We're going to receive our recompense from God. That should put the proper fear of God in you. Yeah, many of us continue to fear the rejection of man more than we love people made in God's image. And if you interact with people that are not born again, if you have that opportunity this week, let me tell you, be bold. Yeah, you don't have to be a jerk for Jesus, just, but, but, but be bold. Be bold. Be winsome. Do you know what winsome means? I love that word. Winsome means pleasant and engaging. And so we, this is what we used to say in campus ministry. We go out and do evangelism on campus. We have our little prayer huddle, and then we say, okay, now be winsome to win some. Be winsome so that you might win some, right? Be engaging. Be pleasant. If you find you're talking to a born-again Christian this week, encourage them to be bold too. Come on, brother, sister. Don't hide your light under a bushel. Get out there. Talk about Jesus. Tell people about the Lord. You're talking to a non-Christian. You find yourself in a conversation this, this week with a non-Christian. Give them the best news ever. Some of you are like, what do you mean? What's the best news ever? Jesus. Salvation. The cross. And they can be made right with God. Give them the best news ever. They, they can be born again. They can have a relationship with the God who made them. And I'll just, I'll just wrap up this morning with this insight from, from Mark Cahill as I was reading this again this week. We have to dispense with this attitude that says we have got to share Jesus. Instead, we've got to shift our mindset from I've got to to I get to. I get to share Jesus. He's, he's given me this precious gift of the gospel. And not only that, but he's, he's, he put his spirit in me. And then he says, hey, I want you to go and tell other people about me. Do you know what a privilege that is? That's incredible to think that we have been deputized to talk to people about Jesus on his behalf. Man, what a, we, got, we, we need to shift our thinking to see that it's a joy, it's a privilege. And I think once we, once we embrace that, we'll begin to engage in the Great Commission. Amen? So we'll stop and just pray for us to that end. Lord, this morning, that's what we pray. We ask you for your spirit to work in us, that we wouldn't, we wouldn't be in the place where we see uh, working with you in the, in the fields that you said are ripe unto harvest. You said they're ready to be harvested. We wouldn't see that as a drudgery. We wouldn't see that as a fearful thing. We would see that as a blessed thing. We, we would shift our thinking uh, away from I, I guess I got to do what Jesus said to do to, 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 man, I get to do what Jesus called me to do. Lord, put in us an excitement, a fervor that can't be, uh, can't be quenched, Lord, that, that we would want other people to know you the way that we know you. And we know that the time is short. So give us a heart of urgency. Give us clarity in our thinking, clarity in our speech. Lord, and let the love that you put in us shine through every word that we speak to every person this week. That's our prayer today, Lord. We thank you for the privilege of being your people and being called into service in your kingdom. And we just pray all these things in your name. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. He came to rescue us. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And if you believe on him, you can come out from under condemnation. What an incredible promise. This new birth is from heaven. It's a great exchange in the heart of the sinner whereby we get a new heart in the Holy Spirit. It means something's done in us, for us, that we can't do for ourselves. Listen to me. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, you can do that today. Don't let another hour pass you by. 
For those who are saved, don't let another day pass without making Jesus known. Emmaus Road Church, 